Hello everyone and welcome to my review of Wipeout on the PlayStation 1. Uh, this was developed and published by Psygnosis and was released on the PlayStation 1 and MS-DOS in 1995 and the Sega Saturn in 1996 and on the Commodore Amiga in 1999. The game is set in the year 2052 and you take part in a racing league called the Anti-Gravity Racing League. You can select from four different racing teams and in those you can select from two different pilots from within each team. There's no difference between the pilots but there are differences between the various racing teams in terms of handling, speed, stability with the ship so you really have to try to find the, the craft which suits you best um, and sort of go with that one. To be honest though, I found that there wasn't a huge difference. There is a difference, but it's not an enormous difference between the ships. And this is mainly down to the fact that the handling system in the game is quite tough. In order to portray anti-gravity, there's no real standard braking system. The brakes are actually actioned by pulling left or right on the shoulder buttons, and this will then sort of break sort of push break the craft into a corner so say you press the left shoulder button and you're turning left it will sort of cause the nose of the craft to to pull more towards the left in the corner um, initially it's quite difficult to get hold of the controls and get used to them because they're just nothing like um, any type of control system you would have been used to coming into playing this it's quite a bizarre system and although other games before it might have um, had a, a similar system, I doubt any of them had such a profound effect on the handling of the game as they do on, on Wipeout on the PlayStation 1. There are various power-ups you can pick up as you go around the track as you may have already seen. These include missiles, rockets, mines, uh, shockwave blast and you can also pick up a shield as well. There are also blue arrow pads as well on the track and these act as um, an automatic accelerator for the ship. There's also a speed boost as well that you can pick up as you go around the track. Um, but to be honest, the, the accelerants can be just as much of a hindrance as they can a help. And this is really due to, again, the handling because the speed of the game is quite phenomenal and before you know it you can pretty much end up being thrust into a corner and of course hitting the wall slows you down. And it's very difficult to get away from the other ships as well. So it can be a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes hitting the the, uh, the accelerator pads. Um, so you have to sort of pick and choose your way through. It's one of these games that you have to know the tracks in order to be successful in it. You just have to keep playing over and over again until you master the quickest way to get around each individual track. The look and feel of the game was thanks largely to a company called the Designers Republic who had a huge input in terms of the design and logos that you see around the game. They also did sort of offshoot merchandising as well. And this was thanks largely to Sony's decision to try to appeal to a more mature audience. What Sony um, considered when they released the PlayStation was that the people that had been playing on Mega Drives and Super Nintendos had grown up and in order to continue to appeal to them as gamers, stuff like Mario and Sonic wasn't really going to work for them. You needed to appeal to them on a different level. And so they really went after those sort of 18, 19, 20 year olds that were going out to nightclubs and so on and so forth. And so the whole Designers Republic thing was then married to the soundtrack of the game. And the soundtrack was provided by Tim Wright under the pseudonym of Cold Storage, with contributions from the likes of Leftfield, The Chemical Brothers and Orbital. And as I say, it was really aimed at those club-going people. And it did work. I mean, it, it was part of a number of games that was aimed at a slightly more mature audience. And it did pay dividends for Sony, because obviously, as we all know, the PlayStation went on to be a remarkable success. In terms of the actual game itself though, because after all just being a marketing tool for the PlayStation wasn't enough, it is actually a pretty good game. It is quite rough around the edges in places. The graphics for its time are stunning, um, 
this huge variety in the tracks. It flies along at a fair old frame rate, and although these days you can see stuff like you know pop up and you know obviously the graphics look nothing compared to today's graphics. You have to also remember that this was a game released in 1995 and the developers were using new technology um, and it really did lay down a, a really good framework for what was to come next. I believe the sequel to this was called Wipeout 2097 and that one had so many more improvements to it, it was it was untrue. I mean, the the handling of the ship was a lot better. The tracks were more varied. The graphics were more detailed. But without this game, that simply wouldn't have been possible. It really was one of those sort of pioneering games. And although it borrows heavily from the likes of F Zero off the Super Nintendo, and maybe even Mario Brothers, if you want to go, you know, even further back. Not Mario Brothers, Mario Kart, should I say? If you want to go even further back, then you know you you know you could put a fair argument for that. But if you go to to games today that use a sort of similar system, you can see that they've all borrowed very heavily from Wipeout. They haven't really borrowed that heavily from the other games, and this is because it was a phenomenal success at the time. People, I think, were tolerant of the dodgy handling. And um, they could look through that and actually, you know, see what game there was that was trying to get out from within. Um, as I said earlier, this was one of the games that I saw on a rolling demo um, showcasing the PlayStation. And this, along with Destruction Derby and, and Ridge Racer, was the real reasons that I wanted a PlayStation. I absolutely love racing games, and this was the real zenith for me. I mean, I'd not seen anything look, look like this, you know, outside of the arcades, and it moves so fast, and it just looked original. It looked like, you know, nothing like I'd ever seen before. <clears throat> obviously, you can point to F-Zero, but obviously, I mean, F-Zero looked nothing like this, you know, as good as this. And, it, you know, to have that thumping soundtrack going as well, you know, it was just... It was just that thing that really drew you in, and it's a shame that it doesn't really seem to apply to consoles these days. Um, they don't really have that awe-inspiring factor that, that seeing games like this had for me back back in the mid '90s. And the great thing about this and Destruction Derby is both of these are available for download off the PlayStation Network Marketplace. Which is great. I, I love the fact that they're keeping these seminal games alive, that they're not sort of burying them. Because there's nothing more frustrating than really good games like this just getting totally buried off the radar. It is a good game, but I would imagine a lot of modern game players are going to have issues with the control system because it is unforgiving and it is a really, really tough game. And it's kind of old school in that respect. Um, you make a mistake, you're going to get punished. Um, even when you first start out in the so-called easier racing league, you are going to get punished. And it's interesting to note that playing this and noting how difficult this game was, how much easier Wipeout HD is, which is the latest offering um, for the PlayStation 3. I mean, that looks gorgeous, but it's so much easier to play than this one. Um, this is, was really hardcore. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.